effective first aid, followed by timely medical evacuation to a field hospital, is the key to reducing the number of preventable deaths on the battlefield. The aim of this presentation is to describe the evolution of first aid in the British Army from the Crimean War to the present day. And this will enable us to interpret the processes of innovation, implementation and diffusion of ideas to improve the clinical outcomes for military casualties. I'm Professor Martin Bricknell, Professor of Conflict Health and Military Medicine at King's College London. This presentation is based on a paper that I wrote with Brigadier Tim Hodgins and is published in the journal Military Medicine, uh, available as open access. So the aim of this presentation is to describe the evolution of first aid in the British Army in order to, as we've said, interpret the processes of innovation, implementation and diffusion of ideas to improve the clinical outcomes for military casualties. The presentation combines a historical review provide some insights into organizational learning and possibly unlearning, and also provides an indication of sources for study of British military medicine. So let's just define the domain that we're looking at. First aid is the help given to someone who is injured or ill to keep them safe until they can go to more advanced medical treatment by seeing a doctor, health professional, or go to hospital. Uh, and this is the definition of first aid by St John's Ambulance. A military first aid is that first aid taught to, to every soldier, sailor or airman. And looking at the chain of evacuation, starting from point of injury to the top left of the diagram, we're really focused on self-aid and buddy first aid from all ranks in the immediate care of casualties on the battlefield. I will touch on the team medic or the non-vocational additional first aider. And some of the presentation will also cover a little bit of the training that was given to non-medical uh, corps personnel who were designated to be medics or advanced first aiders. And all of this happens in the pre-hospital space and using the NATO definition of medical capabilities at role one. So let us now consider the sources of evidence. This analysis is based on policy and practice as published in King's or Queen's regulations for the army, the field service pocketbook or generic military medical training policy. And it's complemented by the use of aid memoirs or pamphlets. And then finally, um, publications in military or military medical journals. Most sources have been accessed either from the internet, the Welcome RAMC Municipals Collection, the majority of which is digitized and available online, and finally by visiting the Museum of Military Medicine. The analytical structure for this presentation covers the period from the Crimean War to 1898, the formation of the Royal Army Medical Corps. Then from the formation of the Royal Army Medical Corps to the start of World War I, then World War I to the start of World War II, World War II to the Falklands War, the Falklands War to uh, Optelic in uh, Iraq, and then finally Optelic to the present day. And the time periods are set by the evolution of innovations in training or organizational design. They are not equal time periods. So let's start off. After the Crimean War, the British military medical services went through a series of significant structural changes, primarily to okay. try. I found this on the web. Primarily to try to join the care of casualties at regimental level with the care of casualties in field hospitals, and this led eventually to the unification of the medical service for the army through the formation of the Royal Army Medical Corps. If we now look at military medical care, we will see that um, the first field dressing was introduced uh, 
in 1855 from a medical department circulator circular that said every soldier should have a first field dressing consisting of a calico bandage four yards by three inches and fine lint 12 inches by three inches folded flat and fastened by pins the rationale for this is cited in the book a treatise on gunshot injuries published in 1862 by sir thomas longmore the first professor of military surgery at the new army medical school and i quote a slight provisional dressing a few judicious directions to the bearers may occasionally prevent the occurrence of fatal hemorrhage or avert aggregation of the original injury and moving on now to the training uh, you can see that the first manual for the medical staff corps was published in 1898 and contains sorry, 1878, and contains detailed instructions on the duties of medical officers attached to corps, so-called regimental medical officer. It included a section of training on regimental step stretcher bearers, covering the syllabus to be followed over at least 12 hours of lectures and drills and the method of examination. They were given a theoretical training on basic human anatomy, field dressing, tourniquet, splints, and bandages and were also trained how to move casualties by stretcher and the method for loading casualties onto carts and railways. A first aid training for the Army Hospital Corps influenced the emergence of formal first aid training within the civilian sector, particularly in response to the increase in industrial accidents in factories. In 1870, the National Society for the Aids to the Sick and Wounded in War the predecessor to the British Red Cross, published a manual for the instruction of attendance on sick and wounded in war by Staff Assistant Surgeon A. Moffat, who was the instructor of the Army Hospital Corps at the Royal Victoria Hospital in Netley. Separately, in 1877, the St John's Ambulance Association first awarded certificates of proficiency in first aid based on first aid to the issue, to the injured, written by Surgeon Major Peter Shepherd, an army doctor working at the Royal Herbert Military Hospital in Woolwich. The next phase was from the formation of the Royal Army Medical Corps in 1898 to the start of World War I in uh, 1914. And this was the period of the Boer War when again the medical services were put under extreme pressure and included the mobilization of volunteers from uh, civilian practice to join, uh, join the army to support the RAMC when deployed. In 1899, for the first time, Queen's regulations and orders for the army contained the following. It is important that officers and soldiers should be acquainted with the original, with the component parts of the first field dressing and with the manner for applying the dressing to a wound. General officers commanding will therefore arrange for the instruction of all officers and soldiers in this subject by means of lectures and demonstrations given periodically during the winter months by medical officers. The 1914 version of the field service pocket book contained three pages of basic first aid instructions covering bleeding, direct pressure, pressure points and improvised tourniquets Schaefer's method of artificial respiration, shock, wounds, fractures, burns, and scolds. And Royal Army medical training um, manuals were frequently um, refreshed and new additions came out uh, across uh, the period uh, up until 1911. As planning for the potential war in Western Europe developed in the first decade of the 20th century, it was realized that it was insufficient medical manpower in the armed forces to support the army on mobilization. So in 1908, the British Red Cross, the St. John's Ambulance and the St. Andrews Ambulance Association were requested to form unlimited numbers of voluntary aid detachments to support the army. Initially, the only recognized qualifications were certificates from St. John Ambulance Association or St. Andrews Ambulance Association. In 1911, the British Red Cross also introduced lectures and certificates in first aid. In 
and in 1912, Colonel Sir James Cantley oversaw the preparation of three instruction manuals across the Council of the British Red Cross Society, and therefore became the author of the first aid manuals for both the British Red Cross and the Order of St John. Now, World War I was um, dramatic in terms of the volume of casualties and the demands on the Royal Army Medical Corps. And this led to uh, the recognition that stretcher bearers needed to be right up close to the front and that um, soldiers needed to uh, have some skills in first aid. However, no new edition of RAMC training manuals were published during the First World War. The slide shows a privately published book, First Aid for the Trenches, some simple instructions for saving the life that every soldier should know. This was published in 1915 and reprinted in 1917 uh, as part of the preparation for the mobilization of the US Army. The preface emphasized the value of first aid. It has been demonstrated in previous wars, but especially in the present conflict, that the final result of casualties not immediately fatal nor inherently so, depends on the promptness and the intelligence in which first aid is administered on the battlefield. Notably also, the RAMC introduced the shell dressing to complement the first field dressing, as this larger uh, dressing was able to cover the more extensive wounds caused by um, shells and shrapnel. Field Service Regulations of 1923 continued the pre-war pre description of the first field dressing and the requirement for all ranks to be trained in its application. However, it very specifically stated that no one other than stretcher bearers is to carry a wounded man unless ordered to do so. Regimental bearers will be employed in rendering first aid to the wounded and collecting and carrying them to the regimental first aid post. This is to emphasize the importance of soldiers actually fighting and winning the far fight. Regulations for the medical services of the army published in 1938 described the duty of regimental medical officers as he will deliver during the individual training period lectures to officers and men on the use of the first field dressing on hygiene and sanitation and on venereal disease. He will also arrange annually with the officer commanding of the unit for the training of stretchers bearers. And an appendix to these regulations were the specific curriculum for the lectures to troops. Lecture one, first field dressing and drowning. Lecture two, the maintenance of health. Lecture three, the prevention of disease. And lecture four, venereal disease. The strong relationship between the REMC and the voluntary aid societies the British Red Cross, St John's Ambulance and, and St Andrews, was maintained. And members of the medical services of the Navy, Army and Air Force were given mutual recognition for their service qualifications in first aid. However, as the threat of uh, bombing by aircraft um, and air raids uh, represented a, a threat to civilians, the Air Raid Precautions Department was set up in the Home Office and it became obvious that these voluntary aid societies could provide reinforcements to the nation's capacity to treat casualties from air raids. The Home Office publication, Protection of Your Home Against Air Raids, contained basic in information on first aid, with a recommendation that people with an interest in these skills should receive teaching from one of the voluntary aid societies. The Ministry of Health also issued a first aid and brief aid memoir. And both. Um, private publishers and the British Red Cross published handbooks specifically dealing with first aid for war wounded. Uh, the Second World War was even more global than the First World War and um, whilst not uh, as lethal for soldiers on the battlefield it reinforced the importance of, of first aid uh, and essentially the story um, of the development of first aid uh, remains reasonably static all the way through to the Falklands War in 1982. At one of the meetings of the Inter-Allied Conferences of War Medicine in 1944, 
the commandant of the RAMC depot summarized the teaching of first aid to non-medical personnel in the British Army. At the outbreak of the war, the custom was to train regimental stretcher bearers to a high standard of efficiency in first aid. The talk on the first field dressing was the only first aid teaching given to non-medical personnel. However, experience in, of mechanization and open warfare showed the requirement for some additional training for all service personnel. The fighting man's duty is to achieve their mission and not to stop to look after a wounded comrade. But a badly wounded man crying out for help can have a demoralizing effect on their team. Medical officers should give teaching and first aid in simple language with practical demonstrations using model casualties. Uh, and this provided a framework um, for the introduction of the pocket aid memoir shown on the slide, first aid for fighting men. This included a mnemonic stop, think and act as the first priority was to stop bleeding with direct pressure and then the use of improvised tourniquets followed by splinting for breaks. Pamphlet number 12, first aid and hygiene of the field service pocketbook of 1944 covered essential medical knowledge for soldiers. And it stated that first aid was an essential part of every soldier's training and required practical demonstration by unit medical officers. In 1943, the morphine styrette was introduced into the first aid outfit of armored fighting vehicles to provide uh, analgesia during the complicated uh, extraction of casualties from damaged uh, tanks. After World War II, the air raid precaution system developed into civil defense and the possibility of conflict endured throughout the Cold War. In 1957, a single publication shown on this slide, The Elements of First Aid, was jointly produced by the Home Office, the Scottish Home Department, the War Office and the Air Ministry in consultation with the St John's Ambulance Association and the St. John, St. Andrew's Ambulance Association and the British Red Cross Society. Therefore, all of the stakeholders in first aid were teaching to a common document, notably though not the Admiralty or the Royal Navy. The document tasked the first aider to keep calm, to think, to use common sense, and then to act. And it defined the three things that save lives as the stoppage of bleeding, shock, uh, stop it, stoppage of breathing, bleeding and shock. And for the army, this was complemented by a unit first aid instructors course and instructors notes, which provided a 10 hour syllabus and lesson plans for the use by medical officers and first aid instructors. In 1961, the then Director General, Lieutenant General Sir Alex Alexander Drummond described common faults in first aid um, that had been identified during operations in Cyprus in 1950. Failure to secure an adequate airway, failing to place unconscious casualties in the coma position, failure to immobilize fractures, over sedating and giving fluids by mouth. He summer, surmised that this was probably the re result of over didactic and theoretical training and emphasized the importance of practical skills. In 19, the 1969 version of the instructor's handbook in first aid withdrew the technique of using a tourniquet, stating the tourniquet has no place as a first aid measure in the control of bleeding. And the rationale behind this is not clear, but it set the view on tourniquet utility in first aid over the next 30 years. First aid training objectives were revised in 1974 and incorporated to Army Training Directive number five and in the 1978 edition of the Manual for Medical Assistance. And this included formal instruction in the use of the morphine syringe ampule. Overall, not much had changed um, between the end of the Second World War and the start of the Falklands War in 1982. So the Falklands War presented challenges in the initial care of casualties, resulting in many having a prolonged period of evacuation before arrival at the first surgical unit. Most units conducted additional first aid training during the journey from the UK down south 
to the Falklands Islands and emphasize the importance of self-help and buddy-buddy first aid. A case review confirmed that and suggested the reintroduction of training on the tourniquet for severe bleeding. However, the professor of military surgery asserted that more limbs and lives would be lost by unskilled application of tourniquets than by neglect of their use. And the official report of military lessons from the Falklands War recommended the introduction of a regimental first aider as an intermediate tier of first aid skills between those taught to everybody and those taught to specific regimental medical assistants. By the 1990s, um, in spite of a successful trial of the regimental first aider and the introduction of the team medic into Northern Ireland, um, the training for this level of care still had not occurred. Changes to first aid training were implemented in 1993 by beginning to align the, the training with the emergence of advanced trauma life support. And there was beginning to be a view that the arrangements and equipment issued at first line, role one, uh, and the group of people that I showed in the first slide um, of the casualty evacuation system earlier in the presentation uh, was beginning to build momentum. And the uh, new package titled Battlefield First Aid was introduced in 1993 and changed the clinical prioritization from the four Bs, breathing, bleeding, burns and breaks into ABCD, airway, breathing, circulation and disability. It also introduced protection of the cervical spine and also introduced the morphine autojet to replace the morphine stirrup. In 1998, the army reviewed these again and changed them into individual direct training directive um, number three as uh, battlefield first aid drills. And the sy sy syllabus shifted to become much more drill orientated um, and focused on skills for the battlefield rather than first aid skills in a civilian context. So the uh, UK Armed Forces then went into uh, Iraq in 2003 and um, Afghanistan at a large scale level in 2006. And this really was the first time that the armed forces had faced significant numbers of casualties over a sustained period of time. And this uh, fundamentally changed the perception of um, casualties on the battlefield from that of uh, a very occasional irritation to an inevitable component of military operations. And so there was considerable emphasis to improve the quality of care at the point of injury and to review the first aid training requirements. So battlefield first aid drills were substantially revised as battlefield casualty drills on the eve of offensive operations into Iraq in 2003. The army finally agreed to introduce the team medic as an additional first aid capability at unit level in 2004. The operational experience of treating battlefield casualties emphasized the preeminence of catastrophic bleeding as the main preventable cause of death on the battlefield. And this led to the introduction of three new items of equipment. The Israeli field dressing, or effectively the compression bandage with an elasticated strap that put pressure onto the wound. The combat application tourniquet as an issued tourniquet to every soldier. And finally, the introduction of the quick clot, a topical um, blood clot uh, initiator that you put on wounds. And these were introduced in 2005 alongside a new training program. The 2005 edition of Battlefield Casualty Drills introduced the concept of catastrophic bleeding followed by airway bleeding and circulation and also reintroduced cardiopulmonary resuscitation as part of the core training and referred to the team medic as a source of additional skills and equipment. 
a formal review of first line medical support in 2012 concluded that these new first aid techniques had contributed significantly to lives saved on operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. There was also um, an urgent requirement to replace the morphine auto injector because this caused repeated uh, needle stick injuries and unpredictable pain control. The transmucosal fentanyl, so called the fentanyl lo lollipop, was introduced in 2017. The, uh, the aid memoirs for battlefield casualty drills and team medic continue to be under constant review and the most recent uh, editions were published in the um, late 2020s. All of these uh, evolutions in skills uh, were mirrored across um, coalition uh, military medical services and led to the transfer of the same knowledge into both uh, United Nations um, requirements for first aid training shown on the UN BFAC slide uh, card on the left and then back into the civilian community uh, reintroducing the um, possibility of improvised tourniquets as a uh, emergency measure in severe catastrophic hemorrhage and this uh, was in response to the increased number of terrorist uh, incidents in the civilian setting. So let us reflect then on that journey. A number of themes emerged from this review of the history of first aid in, in the British Army. The first is the importance of maintaining the institutional memory of the catastrophic nature of wounds in conflict. The majority of combat deaths are caused by explosive munitions that often cause multiple and severe injuries. And although less frequent, military gunshot wounds also cause severe injury because of the energy transfer from high velocity cases. This is very different from the context of civilian first aid. And we can see that as civilian first, as military first aid became more orientated towards the evolution in civilian first aid, in the 1970s, the memory of true combat injury faded and the structure and style of first aid in the military followed the civilian pattern. It's vital that this reality of um, the extensive nature of conflict wounds is not forgotten and is communicated during first aid training. The second theme is the extension of training from uh, medics to soldiers and the, uh, the gradual transition to a formal uh, curriculum and testing for first aid skills in every single soldier. This also includes the training in preventive health um, and keeping yourself um, uh, medically fit and preventing uh, mild disease. This included the uh, introduction of the intermediate first aider um, from experience in Northern Ireland and the Falklands War, uh, which has now been codified into the team medic. The syllabus for military first aid training has always been an exchange of ideas between military and civilian settings. And this uh, continues to the present day and in the last slide of this group, I showed how many of these concepts were introduced into, um, have now been reintroduced into civilian first aid for terrorist or other major incidents. Uh, the final point to pick up is the value of, of archives and the way in which it's possible to uh, determine the evolution of thinking through reviewing um, old medical training manuals and other documentation, uh, including then um, the publications in the military medical literature. Alongside this general themes, there are very uh, specific interventions that I will cover. Um, the first being the uh, first field dressing. And as I mentioned, this was uh, initially um, introduced in the late 18, 
1850s um, as a item of equipment for every single soldier and it was sewn into their tunic and there were detailed instructions for how it should be carried um, as part of uh, the soldier's personal equipment. Um, the first field dressing was expanded to uh, include a greater capacity to absorb wounds with the uh, shell dressing, uh, which gradually faded out of use in the um, 1970s and 1980s. And essentially the design remained unchanged until the introduction of the elasticated component to the bandage in um, 2005 with the so-called Israeli field dressing. The next theme is the evolution of tourniquets. Um, and this slide shows a variety of different tourniquets um, that have been used uh, as issued items uh, in the medical services over the um, course of the last 150 years or so. I guess the most uh, interesting juxtaposition is the uh, picture in the center that contains the tourniquet um, developed by St. John in World War I, uh, including a, a windlass built into the tourniquet, and then the comparative design of the combat application tourniquet in 2005. The only difference being the introduction of Velcro as a means to uh, secure the tourniquet. And the final area uh, of evolution is the development of pre-hospital analgesia. Um, from morphine lozenges being issued um, in the First World War through to the uh, syrette, the auto injector, and then back to a morphine based lozenge uh, introduced in 2017. So in conclusion, uh, what I've done is describe the development of first aid training in the British Army. And I have shown how the operational environment and clinical experience resulted in an evolution of the syllabus and equipment that has been taught and provided to all soldiers to help them care for their comrades on the battlefield until the arrival of a uh, specially trained member of the Army Medical Service. The evolution has been progressive. The, uh, the periods of conflict have increased the pace at which organizational learning has happened. And during periods of low conflict, some of the concepts have regressed back into a civilian setting. Hopefully that's been of inter interest to you. Um, please feel free to uh, contact me on the email shown for further discussions on this subject.